Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kieran Hatzell and I'm a ranger here at St. Abs Head National Nature Reserve. Um, so here to tell you a little bit about the, the wildlife um, and all about the headland itself. Um, so I work for the National Trust of Scotland. I've been here at the head since 2019. I'll just give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I started at the headland here in 2019. Um, I'm originally from Preston in Lancashire. The home of the butter pie, a delicious snack that if you've not tried, you must do. It's definitely put it on your bucket list. Um, sorry, there's a few slides here that we're missing. Uh, before that, I was on the Farn Islands. Um, so I left Preston, I uh, worked in Norfolk for a little bit after doing a countryside management course and went to work on the Farn Islands. So the Farns is an amazing place. Lucky enough to live and work, uh, completely surrounded by seabirds um, in a spectacular location, the Galapagos of the North. So um, hopefully many of you have already visited and if you haven't, it's another one to stick on your list. Um, so yeah, we are lucky enough to see some amazing birds and wildlife while we're out there surrounded by incredible seabird colonies. Um, and incredible migrant birds like this lovely bridal tern, uh, which I was lucky enough to see. Um, and lots of seals as well. So. It was a great place. Uh, from there, um, I went to Fur Island, Shetland, so a tiny little island between Shetland and Orkney. I went to work at the Bird Observatory there um, for four seasons, um, one of the best places in the world, and put it on your list if you haven't been. Uh, the Bird Observatory unfortunately burnt down um, a couple of years ago, uh, but there are plans to rebuild it, and Fur Isle remains my favourite place on the planet. Um, an amazing mix of um, a brilliant community, so great people, um, and incredible wildlife. Um, so yeah, definitely one of the best places you can go in the world. Uh, Looking to see a lot of killer whales, uh, killing seals, which was brilliant. Um, but yeah, moving on from there, I went to work on St Kilda. So for the National Trust for Scotland, I was the seabird ranger out there in 2018. Um, so just for one season, um, spent a lot of time with a cracking snowy owl. I was lucky enough to count and monitor leeches, petrels, and uh, a whole host of other seabirds and wildlife that they get out there as well. Um, it's, it's hard to describe, and I could talk for hours about St Kilda itself, but um, yeah, there really is no other place like it in the UK or probably on the planet. It's like Jurassic Park, full of wildlife. Um, See, so yeah, I work for the National Trust of Scotland, so it's an independent charity, uh, started in 1931. And the Trust have owned St Ab's Head since 1980, so we just celebrated 40 years of owning the headland. Um, the National Trust of Scotland, I'll give you a little brief um, background on what some amazing places we've got. There's such a variety of places, places like Craigie the Castle, Inverview Garden, Culloden Battenfield and the Robert Burns birthplace. Uh, we look after a massive amount of countryside as well. So 76,000 hectares of countryside, 46 Munroes, eight national nature reserves, 45 triple SIs, uh, the only dual world heritage site um, in the UK, which is St Kilda. Uh, over 400 highlands and millions of seabirds. Um, so yeah, um, it really is a brilliant organisation to work for and we're lucky enough to have some amazing properties and places at our, um, in our portfolio. Um, so yeah, I know there's a few more of them here. Some of the wild places we get, St Kilda um, is brilliant. Fingal's Cave is so unique um, on Staffa. Uh, places like Glencoe are sort of wonderful for mountain walkers and Cody Shallot Gorge. Um, some brilliant autumn places as well and winter, winter walks at this time of year. Well, we'll get on to the main star of the show, which is St Ab's Head. So this is a, an aerial view of the headland. Um, you can see all the lumps and bumps in the Maya Loch. So it's quite a small property. Uh, it's not massive. 
So we just 77 hectares, um, the main part of the reserve. And we also on the Lumsden Strip, which is just the coastal part, just up the coast from here. Um, so yeah, we, the, the main headland, just 77 hectares itself. So it's a really small pocket of habitat, kind of in a sea of agriculture. So it's a really important place um, for so many species. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about them now. So St. Abs is ma really heavily designated. I won't read out all these. So if you want to pause the presentation, have a look at it at your own leisure, feel free. Uh, basically, it's, um, it's a national nature reserve. So it's one of only 43 in Scotland. Um, but it's designated, all these designations mean that it, they're basically just a, a token of how amazing the place is for so many different things. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an SPA for the breeding seabirds. It's a special area of conservation for the sea cliffs, the grey seals, the reefs and the sea caves. Um, and it's a triple SI as well. So um, it's a, a big job looking after the place um, and it takes a lot of um, a lot of knowledge, but it means that there's, there's something for everyone. So no matter what you're interested in, whether it be geology, archaeology, you just want to come for a walk or you love wildlife, it is a brilliant place at every time of the year. And see so yeah, a little bit about the geology, basically, you know, millions of years of history, the geology. It's one of the places just up the coast from here, um, is Sicker Point. So it's quite a famous spot for geologists. Uh, we've got a geology leaflet here on site if you visit um, and you can learn a little bit about the, the sort of longer history of the reserve itself and, and how it came to be. Um, it's also, um, we've got three scheduled monuments on site. So this is a shot of Kirk Hill. Uh, showing the ramparts of the old village, um, a huge human history. So uh, going back to the kind of uh, 7th century. So it's a massive lot of human history and I, I won't give you everything um, that we've got, but three scheduled monuments um, that we try and uh, protect and maintain as well with the help of uh, Historic Environment Scotland. Um, but this is the real star of the show. This is the main reason that people come, um, especially in the spring and the summer. Uh, the seabirds, uh, on the cliffs, the, the beautiful sea cliffs, the vegetated sea cliffs, they're absolutely jam-packed with life. Um, so we're lucky enough to have a congregation of around 60,000 or so seabirds. And it is an incredible place. Um, the sights, the sounds and the smells in the summer months are intoxicating. Um, it's, yes, yeah, so we've got about 42,000 guillemots there sort of on the cliff tops. as four and a half thousand pairs of kittiwakes. Um, We've got a few thousand razor bills. There's uh, just over 100 pairs of shags, around 100 pairs of fulmer, and we've got uh, some gannets now as well, which are a new addition to our seabird family. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview of some of the seabirds. So yeah, th th we've got the guillemots, the almost numerous seabird. You come at the right time of year, you can see the, the chicks jumping off the cliff into the water. Uh, the noise is deafening as they whistle. The adults are shouting them down from the cliffs. It really is an amazing spectacle. And for me, it's one of the best things that you could see within a seabird colony is the jumpling period. So that's usually in early July here at the head. Um, so yeah, definitely worth coming for that. Uh, Razorbills, one of those glamorous orcs with that beautiful yellow gape, um, slightly like a guillemot in a tuxedo. Uh, we've got a few thousand pairs of, the, of those sort of tucked away in all the nooks and crannies. And we do get a few puffins, um, but they don't really nest here. The big colonies uh, to the north and south of here, the island may and the far islands. And these, that's the main reason being is they've got lots of mainland predators like foxes, stoats, rats and the likes. Uh, the shags are a star of the show, they're one of my favourites. Um, so yeah, we've got just over 100 pairs of shags. The population has declined quite steeply. Uh, so one of uh, my main jobs in the summer months is to count and monitor uh, all these species. Um, so there, it's quite a task, especially with the guillemots. We count the guillemots every five years. Um, and with the rest of the seabirds, we do annual counts. So we count every single seabird on the property, which is one of the most enjoyable, um, but more time consuming aspects of the job as well. Um, so in the summer, what we'll do is we'll uh, have colony counts, but we'll also do productivity monitoring. So productivity monitoring is basically um, an assessment of how um, each year the seabirds are doing. So it's how many chicks are fledging um, per the number of nests. And that gives us a, as a more kind of year to year barometer of how the seabirds are furring. The general pattern is of decline for most of the seabirds here. Uh, the ones that are booking the trend uh, are guillemots, razorbills and gannets. Uh, th those three species are kind of generally fairly stable or increasing. Um, so yeah, I'll just skip through a few pictures of some lovely seabirds. Kittiwakes, they add the noise to the colony. They are the atmosphere. Uh, the kittiwakes, the sort of picture of for kits, ugh, 
almost UK wide is that we've seen huge declines. So here at the head, we've seen an 87% decline in just 25 years, which is a huge decline. So they, the surface feeders, and so if the food source is not there, then they basically starve because they cannot, can't adapt. Whereas some of the other species like guillemots, um, razor bills can, they can, I mean, guillemots can dive for over 200 meters, so they can exploit a wide range of food in the water table. Whereas the kitty wakes um, basically feed on the surface. So it's really sad to see the decline. Um, they're one of the species that we, um, you know, like I said, they have the real atmosphere to the colony. So when they do decline, you can really, you can really feel the difference. Uh, herring gulls, we've got just over a hundred pairs of herring gulls. Uh, Fulmer as well, um, they're brilliant tube noses that will be sick on you if you get too close to them. And our new addition, the gannet. Um, so gannets, a really interesting story here at the head. Uh, it's one of the newest colonies on mainland Scotland and it's potentially really interesting. So uh, the gannets have started to take over um, a big area where there would usually be guillemots. You can see them here sat in right in amongst the guillemots. It's absolute chaos. So we started with just a few pairs and on a windy day, they all come down from the bass rock and just create chaos in the colony. They'll land in amongst the guillemots that have got eggs or chicks. And they basically just treat it as if it's their own uh, their own cliff ledge. So um, the gannet population here has really exploded. So they're nesting right in amongst the guillemots and causing absolute chaos. Um, in 2017, we had the first chick. Um, and this year we have 46 pairs that nested. Uh, they fledged 11 chicks. And basically we expect the colony to go from strength to strength. We've seen what's happened in other colonies and um, it looks like the gannets will be taken over. So if I was a betting man, I reckon in 15 or 20 years time, the place will be absolutely jam-packed with gannets. It's a really interesting dynamic. So it looks like with the guillemots, they still have a little bit of space to spread out. It's not quite reached its carrying capacity and the cliffs are certainly not full. But as the gannets take over and become more numerous, they're going to get pushed out. Gannets are bigger, they're stronger, and they will outcompete guillemots for space. So it's going to be a really interesting time ahead for our, uh, for our seabirds. So yeah, all change here at the head. Um, other species that we get here, so it's not just seabirds in the summer. I've got a couple of pairs of peregrine falcon. Um, kestrel occasionally nest on the cliffs and sometimes in old kittiwake nests, which is always really amazing to see. Um, and basically the, the head is not just important for birds, but it's important for a whole host of other things as well. So it's a triple, triple SI and part of the designation for the triple SI um, is for its wildflower assemblage. So here you can see it looking quite brown and quite drab in the early spring and it can turn to this. So the carpets of sea pink or thrift are brilliant in the summer. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, so yeah, the, the, the place really comes alive. You can see the yellow gorse bursting into life um, and the thrift just carpet in the place with its beauty. Um, it's also designated for its intertidal zones as well. And so we've got above the waves and below the waves. So there's so much life in every part of the nature reserve. So there's something for everyone. So the vegetated sea cliffs, um, I'll sort of talk a little bit about vegetation. So we've got, here you've got um, a kind of classic example of uh, maritime uh, grassland. We've got sea campion, which are the white pod-like flowers, and we've got thrift as well in amongst it. And some of the more special flowers that we get here at the head, we've got purple milk vetch, uh, spring sandwort, which is a, a nationally scarce uh, flower. Um, we've got rock rose which is a really important plant for one of our uh, specialist butterflies, the northern brown argus. And you can see a bank of orchids there as well. We get a few species of orchid that um, inhabit the headland as well. Uh, some of the early flowers in the spring will be things like primrose, uh, wild thyme. We've got harebells and bird's foot trefoil. And yeah, so all, all that vegetation, all that amazing um, maritime vegetation, is fantastic for invertebrates. So uh, this is the northern brown argus. So a lot of people come to the to St Abbs Head just to see this butterfly. It's one of the best places um, in southern Scotland to see this species. Um, and so you're, you've got to be quite time specific. So um, June and July are the two months, um, two best months to see the species. Usually sort of late June and early July is, is the peak of sightings. Um, and yeah, the, the best places are, there's a couple of areas by the lock, but if you find places with rock rows in, then you're likely to, to find the northern brown harvest. Uh, a mistake that some people uh, make when they come is they're expecting a kind of big butterfly. These things are just a few centimetres across, absolutely tiny and quite moth-like as well. So if you are coming looking for them, 
then expect something that's minuscule rather than something like a red admiral. Um, this is the underside as well. So they are they're really bonny butterflies and worth coming to see, as well as all the other species that we get here um, as well. Um, some of the other insects that we get here, we get um, occasionally in, in sort of hot summers and springs, we get red veined data, uh, really so, sort of like a stained glass dinosaur, they're beautiful, beautiful dragonflies. Um, uh, four spotted chaser, black tail skimmer. Um, we had one of the highest sound, uh, site counts, single site counts in Scotland uh, for this species just a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a rubbish picture, um, but it's something special. So this is a uh, Leicester Emperor, which was found in 2019, and this was just the third record for Scotland, and it was the first for mainland Scotland. So uh, really, St Abs, with it being sort of on the sort of on the border, we're on the vanguard for colonisation and sightings for some of these vagrants and the species that are potentially going to colonise in the future. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just dragonflies and butterflies and birds, there really is such a variety of life here at the head. So we've got eels, newts, sort of common newt, common frog and toads, some of the amphibians that we get here. Um, and the Maya lock itself is a brilliant bit of habitat. So um, the lock was dammed in the early 1900s. It was mainly for recreation um, for the family that owned the, the, the land around that time. So it's for boating, so that you can see the old boathouse here by the lock. Um, and it was for fishing as well. Nowadays, it forms a really, really important part of the nature reserve. So um, a freshwater source, there's been lots of trees planted around it, and it really does turn into a bit of a haven of wildlife um, in the spring and the summer. Um, so yeah, it provides habitat for some um, a few nesting waterfowl. So we've got mute swans, uh, there's coots that nest here. Beautiful birds, one of the best birds in the world, coot, and definitely unappreciated. If you've never seen a coot's feet close up, take time to go and have a look at them in your local park. Um, fissy palmate, they're beautiful. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we get a few a few waterfowl that inhabit. We get little greens that nest here as well. Um, and there's more hens. Uh, we've actually got tufted ducks breeding as well. Um, it creates a little bit of habitat for some of the farmland species as well. So we've got plenty of gorse around here on the headlands. So things like yellow hammer. Um, there's quite a few pairs of yellow hammer on, on the reserve. Stone chats, reed bunting and linnet. Um, they all nest in, in quite small numbers as well. This year we had grasshopper warbler nesting as well. Um, so yeah, there's kind of, there's quite a lot of variety of life um, and it's quite nice that it's been created. What was just kind of a boggy mire has been turned into this really important um, kind of ecosystem essentially um, as part of the reserve. I occasionally get uh, breeding tawny owls as well around the lock. So this is a, a fledgling that was uh, in the trees just this year. And this is an overview. So imagine yourself uh, in the eyes of a migrant bird. So every year, birds will migrate to southern climes from more northerly territories. So if you're flying across the North Sea, you come across this, you can see a lovely freshwater lock and some trees. So what you're looking for basically is fresh water, cover and food. Um, so you've come across the sea, you're a gold crest, you just, you weigh five grams, you've come across the sea and you make landfall at St Abs and it's basically like landing at a five star hotel. You've got amazing um, habitat, plenty of places to hunker down, lots of food and lots of shelter. So there's just under 300 species have been recorded here at St Abs Head. Um, so yeah, we're always on the lookout for, for migrant birds in the spring and the autumn. So things like pied flycatchers sometimes pass through, which are stunning little birds. Um, we have a hoopoo a couple of years ago, um, which looked great in amongst the, the thrift and was photobombed here by a wheat ear, showing off its punk hairdo. Um, but as I said before about sort of uh, southern species colonising, we're kind of starting to see things like spoonbill. So we had five spoonbill passed here um, a couple of years ago as well, and things like cranes. So we kind of expect to see some more of these southern species um, starting to become more common potentially. Um, but yeah, it's a great place to see migrant birds if that's your thing in the, the spring and the autumn. Um, and this was one of the better migrant birds, although it looks like a rubbish duck. Uh, this is a lesser scorp. Um, this was seen in 2019 as well. Um, it was a first record for the county. Um, so yeah, there's always something to see here at the head. Um, as well as all the birds as well, there's lots of mammals. So uh, we get roe deer, uh, things like stoats and weasels, uh, badgers, which are really active at the moment, actually. Um, there's tons of badger activity. You'll find the latrines, which uh, if you look closely, you can actually tell what they're eating seasonally. So um, in August and September time, they're absolutely full of brambles and blackberries. So make sure you go and find a badger toilet and, and, and see if you can identify what's in there. Um, and yeah, quite a few bat species as well are, are seen here at the head around the buildings and the lock. There's a maternity roost actually in the office of the building that I'm currently talking to you from. So yeah. Um, and marine mammals. 
So it's not just land, but it's sea as well. Grey seals, uh, we have a, a large population of grey seals, which has uh, ballooned in the last few years. And I'll talk a little bit about them uh, shortly. Uh, we have regular sightings of harbour porpoise and bottlenose dolphin. And minke whales are also fairly common in the summer months. In August, August September are kind of probably the best months to see minke whales. Had some great sightings this year of animals breaching as well offshore, which is fantastic to see. Um, yeah, so the grey seals, uh, right now um, it is seal season. So the peak of seal season is around mid to late November. Um, and it really is an incredible event. Um, the colony here, to give you a bit of background, we didn't have any grey seals that bred on our beaches um, as recent as 2007. And we've really seen a huge population explosion. So um, last year we had 1,806 pups born on our beaches. Um, and it's one of the more enjoyable parts of the job is doing the seal count. So uh, every year at this time of year, uh, myself and uh, if there's any volunteers interested, we go out and we count the seal pups. So what we do is we've got the, the basically all the beaches, there's about a sort of eight mile stretch between here and the far end of land. And we'll walk that and we'll count every single seal pup. Um, so that gives us basically, like the productivity does with the seabirds, it gives us a, an annual uh, picture of um, the seal population and how well they're doing. And they're doing pretty well. Um, so yeah, this is a, a bit of a, an overview of the seal population and how it's exploded. So monitoring, um, formal monitoring only really began in 2014. And you can see the population has, yeah, it's almost quadrupled in that time. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a, com a complex subject. Now, on a basic level, the kind of um, a healthy population and an expanding population of an apex predator, it bodes really well for the wider marine ecosystem because they're number one, they're top of the food ch chain. So, so if they weren't here and they weren't thriving, we might be worried, but it shows us basically, a, we use them as a barometer for an indication of how well the marine ecosystem's working out at sea. So it looks like they're doing pretty well. Um, now, it's obviously that we'll get conflict with the local fishermen because they're not a big fan of the seals. Um, but I try and sort of tell them that, yeah, basically, this is a positive sign um, for them, potentially for fish stocks. Um, so the argument that, you know, seals will eat all the fish, what I would say to that is it's not really how an ecosystem works. So it will eventually reach its carrying capacity. Uh, but an example would be if you had food for a week, um, you were stuck isolated on a snowy hilltop and you, you knew you couldn't get any more food for a week. On the first day, you wouldn't go into your fridge and eat all the food because there'd be nothing left. Um, and that's not how an ecosystem works. Seals will not eat all the food because there'll be nothing left. So, yeah, um, it, it, I mean, seal season is fantastic. It's all action and we run seal tours. So between now and mid-December, every sun Saturday and Sunday, we'll be there uh, telling people about the ecology of seals. Um, and showing them the incredible wildlife just on the doorstep in Scotland. Um, part of our work is well with seals, we actually put an electric fence up. So this is basically to keep seals and people separate. Um, it's not a great mix. And in the past, we have had people who have put their kids on the back of pups for pictures, uh, people taking selfies or sealfies. Um, and one person actually tried to rescue uh, a pup, uh, took it into the local cafe in his bag, after he'd order a coffee, ask what you should do with it. So yeah, seals and people are not a great mix. So we put electric fences up in a couple of sites uh, just to make sure that they can breed without disturbance. And so we're keeping people at a safe distance so they can enjoy them without disturbing them. Um, so that's a, it's a busy time of year is seal season, uh, it's all action. But yeah, but what we wanna see is healthy, happy pups. So this will be a pup that's about, you know, getting towards uh, sort of two and a half, three weeks old. Um, they can treble in weight in that time. So they start off about 14 or 15 kilograms. And they'll, after just three weeks, it can be about 45 kilograms. Uh, the seal pups pile on about two kilograms every day uh, through the rich fatty milk of the cow seal. So she's um, given a milk of about 60% fat. She's losing around four kilos a day and the pups putting on two. So the energy transfer is absolutely incredible and one of the most kind of apparent and obvious things that we see um, in nature of energy transfer. So yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'll come down and see them if you haven't been to see the seal pups. They'll be here till around mid to late December. And there's a cute sleeping pup. So with all that wildlife uh, comes a lot of responsibility uh, to look after the place. Um, so there's various ways of doing that. So we, um, we have uh, quite a rigorous program of monitoring. So that involves all the species, whether it's seabirds, uh, flowers, um, seals, marine mammals, everything. We monitor it all. 
Um, another aspect of the job is the practical habitat management. So things like gorse control to make sure that they're not take, it's not taking over the wildflower meadows, to make sure the biodiversity is as high as it can be. Uh, grazing management. So our woolly lawnmowers go out onto the head um, around this time of year. Um, and they'll basically take off the year's growth and it's like mowing a meadow so that it means that the wildflowers can have a good crack next year. Um, research, so we work with a few different universities. So Edinburgh Napier University have done lots of studies on uh, disturbance to the wildlife here. Um, and we're trying to work in partnership with the RSPB. They've done a lot of seabird tracking and anyone who wants to work with us, um, we're happy to do it. And we also usually seek out new opportunities as well. So we're always on the lookout for, for more research uh, to inform our management as well. Um, other things we do here at the head, so we've got guided walks and pop-up rangering. So basically just being outside and, and chatting to people and bringing the place to life for our visitors. Uh, we do educational tours for school groups, universities, local community events. So uh, talks and stands and things um, at certain times of year, just to share with everyone how brilliant the head is. Uh, we've got a nature center as well, and we do a lot of things online. Um, so yeah, we're always looking to expand our, our reach and our engagement with the community. Uh, more the practical side of the job. So being a ranger is, you know, it's extremely varied and no two days are the same in this job. And I really mean that. Um, so, yeah, the footpath maintenance is a big job. Uh, it takes a lot of um, hard work because uh, we get about 70,000 visitors every year to the head here. So it really is um, uh, a big job. It's a lot of footfall. Uh, we work a lot on the signage and codes of conduct, make sure everyone's enjoying the place safely. Uh, working on the countryside, furniture, patrolling, policing as well. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of everything here at the head. Um, we work with the local community to do um, to carry out our conservation projects. A reserve couldn't manage without the brilliant volunteers that we get here. Um, you know, the little bit of extra power um, and strength to lift bags of concrete and cement and help us fence and do all kinds of things is really useful. Um, we'll sometimes work with local groups like the Girl Guides here that we've, we've given more weapons so they can all go and bash some thistles. Um, and community action days, so there's lots of archaeology on site here and we'll occasionally do archaeological digs. Um, and we have information volunteers who basically are our um, ambassadors. So they go out on site and uh, talk to people all about the wildlife, all about the reserve and about the work that gets done here. Um, so yeah, St Ab's Head is an incredible place. Um, I mean, there's so much to see, so much to do for literally everyone. Um, so yeah, this is a point where I'd usually ask if you had any questions, but because it's a recorded talk, I can't. Um, but I hope you've all enjoyed it. There's a little bit of a, a whirlwind tour of St Ab's Head, and uh, I hope to see you at the reserve visiting one day. Okay.